these Sunday evenings we are trying to look together at the portrait which Luke, the great Christian doctor of the early church, has left of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke's distinction among the gospel writers appears to be that unlike Matthew and Mark and John, who knew Jesus intimately, Luke had no personal knowledge of or acquaintance with Jesus. Matthew and Mark and John were also Jewish gospel writers, and Luke is a Gentile. And he brings to the writing of his gospel, as you would expect, from a man with some scientific training, however primitive, the desire carefully to research the story of Jesus. And it is rather fascinating to notice that Luke's researches seem to unveil some things about Jesus that are not found in any of the other three Gospels, as well as telling the story of Jesus in a way that is recognizably identical to his fellow gospel writers. He tells us right at the beginning that this book, this compilation, this story of Jesus' life and ministry is the fruit of probably many years of careful research. He had spoken to those who were eyewitnesses of the events that he records in the gospel. And we have been seeing that essentially there are two things that he records. The first, and this we have spent all our time on so far, is a record of the decisive moments in Jesus' life. We have already seen a good number of them, and we shall see more of them. The life of Jesus is not a haphazard life. It is a life punctuated by great crises, by turning points, by immense and momentous events. But those momentous events, those great turning points in the ministry of Jesus are themselves, as Luke indicates to us, punctuated by decisive elements in Jesus' teaching in Jesus' ministry. So far, we have thought about the great decisive events that lay the foundation for Jesus' ministry, His incarnation, His presentation in the temple, His steady growth to maturity, the amazing event of His baptism when, like a dove, the Holy Spirit descended from heaven upon Him, to empower him for his ministry as Savior. And then that awful period of temptation in the wilderness when he faced the onslaught of all the powers of darkness. And we have been noticing how one of the themes that Luke is already working through his gospel is the way in which our Lord Jesus Christ has received the Holy Spirit. He was conceived by the Spirit. He has grown in the wisdom of the Spirit. He has been anointed by the Spirit. He has been led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, but all under the superintendence of the Spirit. He is the man supremely who is filled with the Holy Spirit. And Luke has a view to the way in which the second book he is going to write will begin, when Jesus, who has lived these years in the power of the Spirit, will now empower Christian believers with that same Spirit. But why has Jesus received the Spirit? It is in order to overcome Satan, the enemy of the establishing of God's kingdom. It is in order to show the power of the kingdom. As he does his miracles, as he casts out demons by the finger of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, 
It is that so when he preaches the good news of the kingdom, the power of that kingdom may be made known in the words that Jesus speaks. So in all of these ways, to push back the frontiers of the powers of darkness, to display the evidences of the new creation that God will bring in through His Son, to speak words of saving grace right into the hearts of those who listen to Him. The Lord Jesus has been empowered by the Holy Spirit, and that is precisely where our passage this evening begins. Jesus now returns to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then the great day dawns when Jesus returns to his hometown, when Jesus goes on the Saturday to the synagogue where he had gone time and time and time again during his early days, the synagogue in which he had probably been to school as a youngster, the synagogue where everybody knew everybody else, and everybody else's story, and everybody else's family. And now he was coming home, and the news about him obviously spreading as Jesus returns, having preached in other places, having shown the power of the kingdom of God in other places. It isn't difficult to imagine the excitement in this little town as the boy of Nazareth, now the man of Galilee, returns home. And there he is, seated with others on the Saturday, as was his custom at the synagogue service. Luke gives us some rather nice little touches of authenticity about that synagogue service. It was really a service, basically, of prayers and readings, and there were usually two readings, a reading from the law of God, and then a reading from one of the scrolls of the prophets. And there was a thing called the freedom of the synagogue that meant that Perhaps a visitor or somebody in the village, somebody who had the skill to do so, would be invited to explain the passages of Scripture that were being read. We're very uncertain about this, but it's altogether possible that they were even allowed to select the reading from the prophets. And it's possible that this story has behind it a hidden conversation between the ruler of the temple and Jesus. There is Jesus, and the ruler of the temple comes to him and says to him, we've been hearing about what you have been doing, what you have been saying. We would like you to take the second reading today. Is there a passage that you would like us to read that would be significant for our service on this day when we welcome you home? And perhaps it was by prior arrangement for the sake of convenience that the scroll, because of course they didn't have one book for a Bible or even books for a Bible, but scrolls that were carefully and lovingly kept in the synagogue. And so when the time for the prophet to be read, a servant in the synagogue brings to the Lord Jesus the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and the Lord begins to read this amazing passage from Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And as all eyes are fixed on Jesus, he says, today these very words are being fulfilled in your hearing and in your sight. He identifies himself with the Lord's servant 
upon whom the Lord's Spirit has come, who is anointed to usher in the glory days of God's kingdom and power and majesty and reign. And during the course of these verses from verse 14 to verse 30 that we read this evening, there are basically two things emerge. The first, which is described in verses 14 to 22, is a narrative of the heart of Jesus' message and the initial response to it. The heart of Jesus' message and the initial response to it. And then, from verse 23 to the end of the passage, the implications of Jesus' message and the eventual result of it. First of all, the heart of Jesus' message and the initial response to it. What was that message? Well, it was, of course, that the long-promised time had come. Today. It's hard for us to imagine what that must have meant to these people because they were all people who had been there every Saturday morning in life. And most of them had been there, certainly those who were among the men, had been there for many days in their early years when they had one textbook in school, the Old Testament. Here were people who were saturated in the story of the Bible. It was almost the only story most of them would have known. The only book, certainly, they would have known. The only literature they would have known. Everything for them was Bible. Life for them was informed by their Old Testament. And so they understood what Jesus was saying when he said, Today it is all been fulfilled. They had been taught, we know they had been taught this, that the Bible, their Old Testament, had a storyline that ran all the way through it. It had what clever people today call a meta-narrative with all the different little stories that were in it. There was one big story that ran all the way through it And it was the story of how God's Savior was going to come. The one who had been promised in Genesis 3.15, who would overcome the powers of darkness. The seed who had been promised to Abraham in Genesis 12.1. The seed of Abraham in whom the nations would be blessed. The king who would come, who would sit on the throne of David. The Messiah who would come as prophet and priest and king and be the savior and deliverer of God's people. For years they had been waiting. Their parents had been waiting. Their grandparents had been waiting. Their whole family line had been waiting and passing on this story from generation to generation to generation. And now they were living in days of enormous spiritual excitement because after many years when God had been silent, God had spoken again through John the Baptist and there was enormous anticipation that God was going to do something. And Jesus says, It would seem with great calmness in the synagogue today, in your hearing, in your sight, all the promises of God are coming true, and I am the one in and through whom they are coming true. So that this was not just the fulfillment of all those promises of the Bible in general, but very specifically he says, this most marvelous promise of all, in the scroll of Isaiah, in chapter 61, about the Spirit of God descending on the servant of the Lord in order that the servant of the Lord might bring in the kingdom of God and the great glory day might come. That particular divine promise is being fulfilled in my presence. And he even, by reading from Isaiah 61, indicates to them what it was that was happening. 
the year of the Lord's favor, verse 19, has arrived. They knew what that meant. That was the great year of jubilee that the prophets had looked forward to when deliverance and release would come. They were very familiar with the way in which God had regulated their whole life in a series of sevens. Their day was regulated as one day in seven. They were meeting on the seventh of those days. Their years were regulated because every seventh year became a Sabbath year when the land would be fallow. And there would be this sense of expectation that God was going to do something special in the future. And so the last day of the week, the last year of seven years, there would be a kind of rest that was really like a picture of a new kind of rest that God would bring in. And then every seven times seven years there would be a great year of rest. The 50th year was the year of Jubilee, when not only was the land given rest, but the people were given rest. If they had incurred debts, those debts were brought to an end. If they had to sell themselves into slavery in order to pay their debts, then they would be released from that slavery. And on the great day of atonement, At the beginning of that 50th year, a trumpet would sound throughout the land, the day of freedom has arrived. And although it was a day of marvelous experience for them, debts paid, their land, if they had sold their land, it would be returned to their family and they would no longer be a dispossessed people, but a land-owning people in the land that God had promised to give to them. But they realized it was all, at the end of the day, just a picture of something even more marvelous that God was going to do when He was going to bring such glorious release and liberation that what He says here in Isaiah 61 would come to pass the poor would have good news preached to them. The prisoners would be set free. The blind would be given their sight back. The oppressed would be released. And the day of the Lord's favor, the day of the Lord's grace, would burst in. It was more than just a 50th year, a jubilee year. It was a jubilee of jubilee years they were looking forward to. And the prophets, interestingly, particularly the prophet Isaiah, as he gazed into the future, had seen the work of God in precisely these terms. That that final year of jubilee would not just be a year when material debts would be cancelled, when land that had been sold would be returned and people who had sold themselves into servitude would be set free, but a glorious year of jubilee when this broken, imprisoned earth and these broken, imprisoned people would be set free from all bondage. And God would actually begin what these things were only a symbol of. He would begin a whole new world order altogether. You remember how some of the greatest, the most ecstatic passages in the prophecy of Isaiah look forward to that day when men would turn their swords into pruning shears when the warring nations would cease from war, and when all the tribes of the nations would come together in solemn assembly and worship before God. When the desert would blossom like a rose, when the mountains would dance and the trees would clap their hands together, 
And all the bondage, all the sorrow, all the burden that man's sin had brought upon humanity as a whole and these people as individuals, God would step in and He would restore and repair and recreate everything for His people. And now Jesus is saying that that great day has begun. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down as rabbis customarily did in the synagogue. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And it looks as though, at least for a moment, because they longed that it would be true. Who would not long that this would be true? Who who has ever experienced the veil of tears that this life can become would not long that this good news might somehow be true? And so Jesus, having been praised throughout the region, verse 15, He taught in their synagogues, And everyone praised him, was well spoken of also in the synagogue in Nazareth. Verse 22, all spoke well of him and were, you notice, amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. No wonder, no wonder if you had heard the Lord Jesus with all His divine authority and all His gracious authenticity with His purity, with His knowledge that this was for real and that He really was the Messiah, if you had sensed as they must have sensed the power of the Holy Spirit in His words, He didn't need to say many words, but the words He spoke were words that went like glorious arrows into their heart. And no doubt you too would have said, I want to speak well of Him. It is absolutely amazing to hear the gracious words that came from His lips. They were gracious words, and it rather looks like the people weren't used to hearing gracious words. They were used to hearing the rabbis saying, do better, try harder, what more, don't do this, don't do that, God isn't pleased with you, try to be a good fellow. And here was Jesus come straight from the heart of the Father to say to them that all the promises of God, those marvelous, gracious promises about pardon, about deliverance from the things that we are in bondage to, about God doing something to the very created order that will set it free from its bondage to decay. You couldn't help but listen to Jesus and say, this is the most glorious message that I've ever heard in my life. That was certainly their initial response. But it's very interesting to notice that Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't take their initial response at face value. Indeed, he never assessed anything by anyone's initial response alone. Later on in Luke's Gospel, we find him telling a parable that explains his inner thoughts about what happens when he preaches the good news of the kingdom. He says this good news, he says, I'm like a farmer who has gone out to sow seed. And as I scatter the seed in my preaching, the good news of the kingdom, it falls on different kinds of soil and it meets with different kinds of response and reaction. It's very interesting to listen to how he describes that reaction. This is in Luke 8, verse 13. Some of that seed falls on rocky soil. Those on the rock 
are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. That's the initial response. But they have no root. They believe for a while. But in the time of testing, they fall away. Then verse 14, there is seed that falls among thorns. That stands for those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they don't mature. And oh, thankfully, verse 15, the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. So you see, as Jesus describes what he thinks he is doing in his preaching of the good news of the kingdom, he realizes that it's not the first response that is the key. It is the ongoing response that is the key. It is the response not to the first hearing of the good news. It is the response in an ongoing way to the implications that unfold from the good news that determine whether we have responded to Jesus and His kingdom and His power and His glory in faith or ultimately, as was the case with these people, in unbelief. And it's kind of staggering to see this because it might seem for a moment to be so unlike the Jesus you would like to have. It would be something of a shock to you if you went to a church door after hearing what you thought was a sermon that was full of interesting things and you'd actually rather enjoyed it and you complimented the preacher on the way out and the preacher said to you, that's not the thing that really impresses me. You would say to yourself, he shouldn't be treating me like that. I've just said how much I enjoyed his sermon. What's going on here? That's why it's so important for us not simply to look at the heart of Jesus' message and the initial response to it, but also in the second place at the implications of Jesus' message and the eventual result of it. Jesus' words were indeed gracious, but Jesus' reaction to their response more than took them by surprise and perhaps takes us also by surprise. They are appreciative. But he is singularly unimpressed by immediate reactions. And he is not, listen, he is not naive in his reading of human hearts. I wonder if you remember the words that immediately precede in John's Gospel the famous story about Jesus' interview with Nicodemus. It's one of those places where chapter divisions are actually quite unhelpful. Just before we are told about how Nicodemus, the Jewish theologian, came to Jesus by night and Jesus spoke to him about his need to be born from above. John tells us that Jesus didn't easily trust himself to those who said they believed what he said because he knew what was in a man. He knew what was in a man. And that's what we find here in Jesus' response. He knows what's in these men and women for all their initial response, their immediate positive reaction, for all their enthusiasm about His gracious words and how well He is speaking. He understands that they are going to be the very ones who will reject the implication of the message that He has come to bring. The implication of the gospel which he will die on the cross to effect. And we see this in the way in which Jesus goes on to speak to them from verse 23 onwards. I hope you, I hope you feel how staggering this is. 
They're amazed at the gracious words. They say, doesn't he speak well? And he says, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. What's he saying? Well, he's saying several things. Number one is this. He's pointing out that they will turn against him. Verse 23. Surely you will quote this proverb against me. Go on then. Heal yourself. Do here, if you can, what you did in Capernaum. What is it in their response that enables Jesus to see through the superficiality of their response to the truth that is in their heart? I think it probably lies in the words at the end of verse 22. They thought he spoke well and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. But what they said was, and if you've been following along in Luke's gospel, this should strike you like a thunderbolt. Because up until this point, everything in Luke's gospel has been saying from the birth narrative, He is the Son of God. From the event in the temple. Didn't you realize, Mary and Joseph, I should have been in my Father's house? He is the Son of God. In His baptism, the voice that speaks from heaven, this is my beloved Son. In the great conflict that there is with Satan, In the desert, if you are the Son of God, then do this and do this. The whole story so far in Luke's Gospel has been to hold up to us the identity of Jesus. He is the very Son of God. And these people in his hometown who have known him so long, who have heard so much about him, who have seen this steady progress and these evidences of divine grace and divine power in his life, what do they say? How can this be? He's the son of a mere carpenter. He is the son of a mere carpenter. Or even if they meant that as a compliment, the best they are saying is, isn't, isn't this amazing that our little town can produce somebody who speaks so well, whose father was a carpenter? And they don't even realize that by these words, they have put on display to the intuitive understanding of our Lord Jesus Christ that they do not begin to understand the good news he is proclaiming that they have not begun to see who he is that is proclaiming it. And indeed, what they are really doing is demeaning him. They are demeaning him. They are turning the Son of God into a mere local celebrity. And those who were the first to praise him turned out to be the first who rejected him. But Jesus has more to say. You see what he goes on to say in verse 24. He not only points out that they will turn against him because they don't recognize who he really is. They don't really have faith. He hints that they share the same sinful traits as those who went before them. I tell you the truth, he continued. Just as it has been true in the past, so it will be true of me. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. What's he saying? He's saying, I am already here beginning my ministry among you. I am already experiencing the very same things that God's prophets have consistently experienced. Consistently experienced. That among those who have known them best, 
the masks of self-defense have been strongest. Why? Because we know who he is. We know who he is. And he is thinking here about the ways, of course, in which the prophets of God time and time again came to the people. And without exception, they were all doing exactly the same thing at different times in different ways to different groups of people. The cutting edge of all prophetic ministry in the Old Testament, in the ministry of Jesus, right through the history of the Christian church has been this. It has been to expose the self-deceit of sinful hearts and to unmask hypocrisy. And in order to defend themselves, they are going to have to resist the Lord Jesus. You will say, of me, physician, heal yourself. You will do to me what has happened to every prophet God has ever sent to you. You will find ways of hiding behind a mask that will protect you from the searing heat of God's Word, from the sin-exposing power of God's truth. And in order to do so, it will be necessary for you because you could never say you were rejecting God's Word. It will be absolutely necessary for you in the process. There is no other way of doing it, you see, my friends, than rejecting God's servant. No prophet received in his home town. You read through the prophets and you find that time and time again they were doing what Jesus was doing here. He was saying, I see your masks. I see your initial response. I see and hear you commenting on my gracious words, but I see behind the mask to the reality. And I see that the reality is a reality of self-deceit and self-defense. And you will undoubtedly find ways of defending yourself against the revolutionary power of God's Word in your life. And in order to do that, you will have to reject God's prophet even when he is the Son of God himself because there is no other way you can defend yourself against the power of God's Word. When instead, when God's Word comes to me and shows me how self-deceived I have been, how I move around in order to defend myself against the incursions of God's Word, how I will even take down believers in Jesus Christ, demean them, be they prophets with a small p because they speak the Word of God to me, or prophets with a slightly larger P because they minister God's Word to me in public, or be they prophets with a large P because they are the very people who speak in Scripture, or be they the great prophet, Jesus Christ. I've got to bring them down because the thing I could never say openly is, I am hostile to God's Word, and I will not listen to it through you. When God's Word presses in upon your conscience, it really is the only thing you can do. And the evidence of it is that they did it when Jesus himself was the preacher. And Jesus was exposing their hypocrisy. And you know how they should have responded. They should have said, Oh, Jesus, this is the truth about us. Help us. Save us. They should have responded as we were trying to respond this morning in the 51st Psalm when the prophet Nathan came to David and exposed 
his hypocrisy. And David cried out and said, Oh God, it's true of me. I lack integrity in the inner parts for all the mask of my life in these nine months. I am a ruin inside. Have mercy on me. Cleanse me. I'm filthy. Deliver me. I'm in bondage. Recreate me. I'm broken down. Instead, you know what we do. We harden our hearts as they hardened their hearts. And we become, alas, simply angry. There's a very fascinating thing happens in Jesus' ministry. It actually happens in the ministry of many of the prophets in the Bible. But it's very notable in Jesus' ministry and in no gospel more clearly than in Luke's gospel. That Jesus finds himself, I sometimes wonder if Luke does this, brings these two things together very deliberately so that he may show us who Jesus really is. He brings together Jesus dealing with two totally different kinds of people. People who are broken and poor and weak and marginalized and don't know where to turn And they hardly know how to approach Jesus. And he comes and he embraces them. He fulfills those marvelous words of the servant song in Isaiah. That he comes to a bruised reed and he doesn't break it. And to a dimly burning wick. And instead of snuffing it out, he quietly blows it into life and fire and vitality. And Luke has an absolute fascination with the way in which Jesus deals with the weak and the poor and the marginalized who are just crying out for help and salvation from Jesus. And he is gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But then Luke's gospel is punctuated by a whole series of encounters that Jesus has, sadly, with religious people. Not only religious people, but people he actually describes as hypocrites. That is, wearers of masks, religious masks. And when Jesus meets with them, Jesus is unyielding, and unbending, and rapier-like in his words. His word is a sharp, two-edged sword that slays their hypocrisy, that breaks through the masks, that exposes them for what they really are. He's this marvelous way of putting it when he says about these people. He says, you know what is characteristic of people like this? It is that they get a cup of tea or a glass of water and they strain out a gnat. Oops, there's a gnat. I'd better get rid of a gnat. And they, they'll take all kinds of care and time just to get rid of that nasty little gnat that would make my water impure. And they don't realize there's a camel swimming around in it and they swallow the camel. People must have been splitting their sides when Jesus was saying that except those for whom it was so desperately and sadly true. And you see them later on in Luke's Gospel. They're popping up here and they're popping up there and saying, Jesus, you shouldn't be doing this. Jesus, your disciples shouldn't be doing that. Jesus, you shouldn't be doing the next thing. And all the while in their hearts, they're planning to destroy him. And he is absolutely unbending, absolutely unyielding. Because he longs to be able to show the truth about the human heart. And he sees these people who are weak and marginalized and they're crying to him. They're saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And behind all the masks, there is stony soil. You know, I think at the end of the day, 
The only way of salvation for those of us who are Christians is to cry out, God, have mercy on me. I am the hypocrite. I wonder if you've ever heard of John Bradford. John Bradford was martyred in the year 1555 in the persecutions in England under Mary. He was burnt at Smithfield in London. He must have been one of the godliest men in England. He was a glorious preacher of the gospel. You can still get his works. He was a great Christian. Do you know he often used to sign his name, this John Bradford, he often used to sign his name, John Hippocrat. I wonder if you would do that, Christian. I wonder if you'd be prepared just on a blank sheet of paper to write to the Lord Jesus and say, Dear Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. John Hypocrite. Because you see, that's the thing these people refused to do, and because they refused to do it, they had to find a way of getting rid of him. And they tried to. Jesus goes on to hint that they will see the kingdom blessings taken from them and given to others. He says, he says, I assure you, there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, severe famine. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of the widows in the land, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And There were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman, who was the Syrian. You see what I mean when I say Jesus is determined. He has a backbone like steel. Or did you expect or did they expect Jesus to say, I'm I'm really sorry? If I hurt you, sorry if I've embarrassed you in any way. But you see what he's saying here. He's saying the blessings that might have been yours, they're going to go somewhere else. Just as was true when there was this same failure in the days of Elijah and Elisha, God's blessing was experienced by other people. Of course, he's thinking about what is actually going to happen in history. It actually happens in history. All the blessings, those glorious parts of the inheritance that were promised to God's people. They rejected them and refused them. And so God said, I'm going to find a way of bringing these blessings to others. And so the blessings came to the Gentiles. But you see, it's the principle that is a perennial principle. If I refuse the unmasking, then I will miss the blessing. I will miss the blessing. And oh, that's true for us today too, isn't it? How much gospel hypocrisy. Instead of crying out to the Lord and saying to the Lord, Lord, will you just have mercy upon me? How much gospel hypocrisy has led to those who profess the Christian faith to discover nothing of the blessing, nothing of the blessing, because it's gone somewhere else. And that was what happened to these people. This land was going through a period of a year, maybe, maybe up to two years, when God was pouring out extraordinary blessing. And you remember what is said about Jesus in his hometown. He said that he couldn't do any miracle there because of their unbelief. Not that he had no power to do it. Not that Jesus is limited by people's little faith or little unbelief. but that it would have been thoroughly improper for him to work a miracle there when they had rejected the person who was identified as the king in God's kingdom by the miracles he did. And so they missed the blessing. 
I wonder if you are missing the blessing tonight. I don't know what's in your heart. The truth of the matter is most of us don't even know what's in our own hearts. But if God's Word by God's Spirit is somehow this evening applied to you and the Lord is saying to you, I'm talking about you here. You know this is for you. Then let me ask you a further question. How much blessing are you enjoying in your Christian life? How much of a thrill are you finding in the worship of God's house? How much pleasure and sweetness in reading God's Word, in fellowshipping openly with God's people, in confessing our faults to each other so that we may share with each other and encourage each other? Is it all gone? Well, it must have done. It must actually all have gone. Dear friend, it must all have gone because the only way that you can get that blessing is by the mask being torn off. And you're saying, my greatest need is for God to be merciful to me because I am the hypocrite and I stand in need of grace and mercy. And as my sins are privately exposed, thankfully privately exposed before the Lord, He has mercy on me. But the tears of my repentance wash my eyes clean and I see my fellow believers much more clearly, they too have received Christ's grace and I want to embrace them, to be with them, to love, to praise God with them and I want to learn to pray with them, to share with them, to encourage them, to say, will you help me here? I'm in need of help here. But the eventual result of Jesus' message is spelt out for us in verses 28 to 30. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. Isn't that interesting? It tells you his message had got home, doesn't it? There was none of this. Well, that was interesting. They were absolutely livid. And because they were all livid, they tried to destroy him and silence him forever. Interesting in the midst of all this that they do this on the Sabbath day, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? Here they are, pious and righteous, and Jesus is invading our pious righteousness. But you see, hypocrisy can never be completely consistent. Never. And they want to commit murder on the Sabbath day and so break two commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And thou shalt not kill. And instead of having their pride slain, they seek to slay Jesus. Of course, in the purposes of God, they never could. What an amazing statement verse 30 is. Don't you wish, don't you wish that Luke had put in a little footnote here and said, I spoke to three people in the town and they told me exactly how Jesus did this. How did Jesus do this? He just walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Wow! Glorious. Because they couldn't keep him back from where eventually he was going to walk straight through the crowd to Calvary. He wasn't going to die as a martyr. He'd come into the world to die as a savior. And they discovered at the beginning as they were taught at the end by this amazing miracle of Jesus that he was different from what they imagined and he was very different from what they demanded. And he always is. Because the real, authentic, 
holy, loving, passionate Jesus. Cannot be made in your image. You must learn to yield to being made in his image. And that would have meant for them and certainly means for us that Jesus would undeceive the self-deceived. And he would unmask the truth about those who thought that they were truly trusting in the Lord, but never really were. And the test of all that spiritual reality is that when he moves into your life through the circumstances he brings to bear upon you in different pressures that bring new thoughts to mind, when he moves into your life through the Word, that you just bow before him and you say, Lord Jesus, this is for me, and it's awful, but it's true. And if I'm ever going to experience these kingdom blessings, I need to have you as my Savior. Now, my friend, are you sure that your Jesus is this Jesus? Because this Jesus is the only Jesus who can save you. 